Hello, everyone. Thanks for uh, sticking around for so long after lunch, after all of the extra free t-shirts have been given and things like that. And uh, thanks for coming to what I think is the talk that has the most clickbaity title of all <laughs> in the whole conference. Uh, my name is Ram. I work uh, as a chief evangelist at the Cloud Foundry Foundation. Um, and today, I'm going to go through a talk that's kind of very personal to me. I, I do open source full time. And all of the recent uh, you know, events around licensing and things like that um, have really sold the talk on my behalf, uh, but have um, you know, also affected me um, in ways that I uh, thought I should you know, come forward and share uh, as part of this talk. Now, uh, I wanted to start with like the earliest evidence of cooperation and openness that I could find. And um, this is like a good example of a community effort um, where you know, people are just helping each other. Uh, I shouldn't say people, but you know, whatever. Uh, and, and, and soon, you know, the picture sort of turned around. And um, it's, uh, it provided evidence of infighting in the community. And uh, you know, what, what was you know, organisms helping each other uh, soon became uh, you know, people, uh, people you know, turned against each other. And this is what the human version of that looks like. So um, I'm sure everybody has heard uh, all of the different stories. And um, obviously, I'm going to talk about it in a lot more detail uh, in, in slide 25. But um, I'll let you know that as an engineer um, in my formative years, licensing is hard. Um, licensing is complicated. Licensing is not transparent. Licensing is uh, it, it's very difficult to explain what it actually is to somebody who's just you know exposed to programming and um, who just knows like a bunch of different algorithms and um, they know which optimization problem to solve and things like that. And then if you introduce them, uh, you don't expect them to be introduced to licensing and other things as they start off as a programmer. And as a result, even after spending like a decade um, you know, working on very complex software problems, they end up being largely illiterate about you know, what's the licensing of that library that uh, you decided to copy from Stack Overflow and uh, you know, make a reference to something somewhere else on some forum that somebody had put out in, I don't know, 2008, things like that. So it's, it, to me, it represents the biggest quantum of risk in software development right now. It, it's not being out-programmed by your competitors. It's not being out-marketed by, um, by other companies and things like that. But it's about you know, getting the you know, rug pulled from under your feet as you start to use open source components and libraries that don't have the right kind of licensing inside. And so getting back to the topic, what constitutes use and what constitutes abuse of um, software that you find? So the, the way I designed this talk is to introduce some of the terms. So people here might definitely be aware of a lot of these things. but. You did see the 101 board as you walked inside. So um, I think it's incumbent to define a lot of the terms before moving on. And uh, it's really meant for people who don't have a good idea of what licensing is. And I intend to uh, walk people through a few examples that have happened not just recently, but in the past as well. And obviously, Redis is in both camps. So. Um, before doing that, let me throw another interesting th term just to confuse and stir the pot a little bit. What constitutes fair use? And um, I think ever since um, people with the long hair and the beard started to do the Linux work and uh, become popular and write you know, thousands of words online and start discussing in forums and fight as much as they could, uh, they've been throwing this term around. And um, I've read it. I've understood it in a certain way. I've interpreted it in a certain way. And then I started to actually be employed by companies. And then my understanding of that changed. And you know how it is. So everybody has a very um, different notion of what fair use is. And um, I think you know, the, the difficulty that the community is seeing today is largely because you know, every human being in, 
interprets fair use in a manner that's most uh, profitable and uh, applicable to them. Um, let me start with the consequences of you know, licensing and uh, switching around licensing and things like that. And uh, I think the downsides are pretty obvious. Um, people break away into different communities and uh, start to work on these problems differently. And uh, there's a lot of fragmentation that we've seen within the community. And um, it might or might not be a good thing. So uh, you definitely want more people to innovate on projects. Um, you definitely want more people to work around different forks in a way um, if the underpinning philosophical nature of the tools differ. But if it's really, you know, about flexing and seeing who's like the who's got the more marketing chops among your uh, different communities and things like that, uh, it can really break people into into smaller communities, which you know isn't good. It it results in reduced adoption for both tools. It, it's not great for either one. Um, there's there's a there's a notion of uncertainty that will come about within the community at large about, OK, which one of these projects is going to survive? Which basket do I put my eggs in? Which horse do I back? That kind of situation. And given enough dev, sec, fin, ops, whatever the next big thing is for a developer, I'm sure they can do without the overhead of you know all of the, all of the uncertainty. And there's potential legal implications as well, uh, which you know going by recent events is, uh, is not just potential. And what a lot of these companies and communities do to justify their license changes and you know, their, their whole um, um, use of the system is um, they claim to be building a business, um, which I think is the least of all the evils. Uh, but also, they want secure the freedom around the software that they're building. They want their communities uh, to get the right kind of recognitions and the patents and the trademarks awarded to the individuals that are contributing. And um, I've heard them all. I'm sure we've all, as a community, heard all of the different ways in which people justify these actions. But I really haven't come to terms with it uh, personally. Now, uh, the big examples was, I think, in 2018, MongoDB switched from a GPL to a server-side uh, public license. Uh, Elastic, after that, moved from an Apache to an Elastic license, um, which is, I guess, not the most creatively named one, but it is what it is. And I'm sure you're all wondering, you know, at least some of you, uh, those who are here, or those who might be watching in future, might be wondering all of these uh, different terminology that's there. But let's take a break. Uh, learn about these terms very quickly and uh, you know resume uh, the conversation. So the first thing I'll throw out is what is public domain? So in the context of software ownership, being in the public domain means that all of the intellectual property around a piece of software, and we'll restrict all of the terms that follow um, and most of the discussions that follow to refer to software. OK, uh, and software intellectual property. So public domain uh, means that the software is freely available for people to use, to modify, to redistribute, um, and to you know, even build a business upon. So uh, that's what most people refer That's what is referred to by uh, public domain in most contexts. Now, the other end of that is what is known as proprietary software. And that's what most of us are used to seeing and consuming and using and um, interacting with day in and day out. Um, it, it's, it's really broken down into two pieces. So there's ownership and there's control. And both of these will rest with um, the, the organization that really chooses to um, build this software. And that's. Uh, proprietary stuff. And I'm not going to spend more than 25 seconds on this slide because you know it, this is Open Source Summit. And uh, there's other places where you can learn about that. But uh, those are the two ends of the spectrum. And somewhere in between, there lives or there's space for what are known as permissive licenses. And that's really the gray area that we focus on. And that's where the human factors come into place, the interpretation of 
what permissive actually means is uh, comes into play and that's why i have a job but uh, you know so a permissive license is one where users are granted freedom but there are certain restrictions about what you can and cannot do and depending on what kind of freedoms users are granted and what it is they can and cannot do uh, there are many permissive licenses so different permissive licenses permit you to do different things to uh, the software for example there's a, a mit license which is quite popular i mean i think all of these are quite popular in the community to be honest um, so the mit license um, has a clause for example that says everywhere the software is being used make sure that the um, text of the license appears in any derivative uh, software now there's the bsd uh, family which is again broken down into like two clause and three clause bsd and things like that where um, two clause is better if you want to do like commercial stuff with the software um, three clause is uh, you know better if you if you care about like branding and attribution and things like that in order to in addition to having some um, interest in how software gets distributed commercially um, apache is one of the better more um, one of the better less restrictive uh, permissive licenses i know for a fact that a lot of the linux foundation projects are licensed under uh, the apache uh, license and um, there's one other family of licenses that uh, i have to mention so these were these are not exactly uh, public domain licenses uh, but again they exist just from the name you can say they exist uh, to be the antithetical they exist to be antithetical to what copyright is and so um, copyleft is a, a range of open source licenses which uh, which stipulate that you have to license the piece of software that you derive as the same license as the one upstream from it so if you have a project a and you create a project b that encompasses certain elements of a or is a dependency of a or you know is is um, involves a in some way then b has to have the exact same copyleft license that a has now it could be one of these it could be um, something else so that's uh, one of the ways in which copy copyleft is um, slightly restrictive in terms of uh, in terms of what their license is and some examples are you know gpl and um, other things that sound like gpl so um, then there's the there's the very famous business source license which is um, which is probably the bane of our existence right now but uh, the business source license is is not like in a purest terms a business license but um, it's a source available license um, it has some open source characteristics it, again it allows certain things that you can do uh, but there's uh, there's a lot it does in terms of placing restrictions especially um, in terms of what you derive from software that applies a business source license and things like that um, few more terms so ip i think which which we should have designed first uh, ip refers to um, the set of legal rights around a particular piece of software that protected from um, protected as an invention and as a creation and things like that um, in some cases patents are granted to people that own uh, the intellectual property and you can create what is known as a trademark around uh, these uh, entities that you have uh, intellectual property rights over the other big thing that this community has you know um, thrown around is uh, is the notion of free uh, i'm sure everybody has heard of the free as in beer and all of the other analogies in terms of software um, and then the one definition i think uh, the community is still evolving and still um, it's it's the root of all open source evil if you ask me is is this notion of freedom that uh, that is given and so uh, freedom really rests on these four sort of pillars um to be able to um, you know study use it modify it and uh, redistribute any piece of software 
Now, these freedoms uh, typically come with a certain kind of responsibility, according um, according to you know the community at large, and uh, these responsibilities live to serve a certain obligations where um, derivative work, like I mentioned in um, some of the licenses before, the derivative work um, comes with certain stipulations and things like that. I think that's enough of definitions um, for a post-lunch session. Let's really look at some, um, some examples of what actually happened. So MongoDB, hopefully I'm not offending any of the sponsors in the next few slides. Um, if I am, well, um, so be it. <laughs> so MongoDB, a, a, a very popular NoSQL database provider, as, uh, as they like to market themselves. Um, had the GPL, the GNU public license for a long, long time. Uh, in the year 2018, MongoDB decided to switch from the GPL to a, a server-side public license, which, if you recall, um, is, a, uh, is a permissive license. But it also, the intent was to allow certain um, modifications to the way uh, to actually gain control of certain uh, things that they wanted to do commercially and things like that. Um, the, the whole move um, was you know, received quite badly by the community. Mongo, again, was built on uh, the shoulders of a lot of people who made community contributions in the hope that you know, it will continue to remain free um, and openly available software. Now, the, the licensing stuff obviously um, made it very different. And just in terms of product evolution, along, long after the switch, we could see that they moved to like MongoDB Atlas and MongoDB Hosted and all of this fun stuff that uh, you know, made them happy, I guess, but did not sit too well with the community um, and things. Uh, another case um, was Elastic in the year 2019, so that's five years before, um, nearly five years ago, made a switch uh, in their licensing model to something what they at that time called the Elastic license. And this was for Elasticsearch and things like that. Um, they were following an Apache license uh, previously, and then they moved to Elastic, which was really another name for the server-side public license, which meant that they had control uh, over a large part of the project, and that meant that they could exert a lot of influence in how it was used commercially, uh, what have you. It was, um, one of the clauses was that you couldn't create like uh, what they defined as a combination product, um, and you you have to open source any modifications that you made. And so MongoDB could build a business on top of MongoDB freely, but if you were to write some um, stuff around MongoDB and wanted to commercialize that, you were not able to do that. So uh, that was really uh, the MongoDB story. And again, as you can imagine, in the many years that Mongo existed, by 2019, they had a lot of people who had, in fact, built some commercial offerings around uh, the project. And so um, it was it was a circus. but. Let's talk about the wars. Uh, and I don't mean the ones that are actually happening. Um, I, I, it pains me to think that uh, we live in these times. Uh, but the ones that are you know, more relevant to, uh, to this community. Um, so um, Open Tofu sort of came together at, last, uh, at the last edition of Open Source Summit held in Bilbao. It was wonderful to see that the community could you know, coalesce around something that they cared about so deeply and wanted to like you know further a project around it and the whole um, the whole move for hashicorp to you know change their licenses and revoke a lot of the uh, permissions around using the modified software didn't sit too well with them now just in terms of a quick uh, timeline HashiCorp was founded in the year 2011 um, and then before 2014 or 2015. So, like for the first few years of their existence, they developed a lot of tools like v Vagrant and Packer and uh, Console and all of these tools that had developer experience at the heart and meant to be open source tools that were uh, that were 
you know, designed to make developer life comfortable. And it's one of these cases where they actually achieved these aims. And so there was a massive thriving open source community around the project. Now, few years later, uh, after working on a lot of things, I think in 2014 or early 2015 was when uh, the first Terraform um, project started to appear. And in true HashiCorp fashion, this was conceived as a as an open source tool from the beginning. And a lot of the developers found favor uh, in Terraform and what it could do. And the you know, massive paradigm shift it brought along for those who were chasing after like infrastructure as code and the GitOps world and things like that. Um, a few, so between 2015 and 2018, it was huge for the Terraform community. The, the, the community you know, solidified the Terraform project itself. They launched what were known as extensions. So people were using it for a lot of different things and they were able to build things around Terraform. And all of this was happening in an open source world. And you know, the, soon after, um, I don't know if the company got greedy or if they had problems or what, how to define it, but um, some murmurs started to appear about HashiCorp wanting to switch licenses and then a very sudden decision was made in August 2023 to actually switch licensing uh, from an open so from a Mozilla permissive license to um, you know one of these source server side source available kind of businessy uh, licenses and the entire community was uh, was really taken by shock because HashiCorp had a decade of goodwill built by you know among the open source contributors and the devops community and all of these uh, people who were uh, working on it at large and so it really came as a shock that you know a company that was built on a foundation of making developer experience better would actually just for licensing concerns um, switch uh, switch gears um, Soon after, maybe I think a week after this change, I think Open Tofu was announced. Uh, and Open Open Tofu was, I think it began as an independent project, but within the first few days, moved to like the Linux Foundation. And um, just when the Open Source Summit in Bilbao was uh, due to happen, Open Tofu was announced as an official project there. It's received a lot of love since then, and it, you know things were going on about. Uh, you know, just improving open tofu adoption, making sure there's feature parity and things like that. And about a couple of weeks before, uh, just in April 2024, like maybe 15 days ago, um, HashiCorp sends this letter to the open tofu community about having copied certain code from their code base. And then uh, it was in the form of a cease and desist letter. Um, and their their whole idea was that there's heavy copyright infringement about what Open Tofu did and things like that. So what actually happened there was um, HashiCorp changed the so whenever a license change happens, it affects a code base from the date of that change. And so HashiCorp had, or rather, the Terraform community had switched licensing licenses in August 2023 and then they brought over a piece of code from before August and then created certain modules with that and then the open tofu community derived from Terraform pre-August 2023 themselves and they also continued to work with the same thing and so there is a there was now a point where the same piece of code from before August 2023 was both in uh, the HashiCorp Terraform code base and the Open Tofu code base, which is bound to happen when you are a fork of each other. Uh, so, you know, the 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 community is just you know aghast right now about how could somebody you know choose to do something um, so blatantly uh, stupid, right? Um, and and um, I think there was a lot more that happened after this where a few people in the community actually said approved of this and i think the unofficial open tofu response has been to fork off um, or whatever so uh, there's uh, there's there's not been too much uh, major development in in the past uh, 
in in terms of the legal dispute but i think you know we're we're waiting to see how that pans out but um it's definitely it definitely does not make technical sense it does not make legal sense to pursue this path and hopefully you know the expensive lawyers <laughs> see some uh, see some sense in that and the other uh, story that has been in the press recently is the whole uh, valky and the redis fork so the background to this is that um, redis which was a um, which was a project that happened in well before 2010 so about 15 years ago almost uh, decided to you know there's this individual person who said okay databases are not good enough for me so all good open source projects i think um, start at a start with a very opinionated developer so um, there was an opinionated developer who said databases aren't good enough for me i'm going to create something else for what i need uh, and they created what is known as um, what we now know, uh, know as Redis, but Redis stands for, I think, uh, some dictionary server. So um, Redis was conceived with being a key value store um, uh, from the beginning, which uh, relational databases were not very optimized for. Um, I'm sure there are some Postgrel nerds here on the floor of this conference who will disagree with me, but uh, that was why Redis was conceived. Um, Redis was originally offered under an AGPL version, uh, an AGPL license, and they continued to grow and thrive in the community for the niche use case that they solved extremely well. Um, the the in, in February of 2019, um, which was uh, the Redis community's first strike, uh, they decided to switch licenses um, from being the GPL one to a Redis source available one, which is one of those bullshit business licenses. And um, it was not, it was not, it, the community did not take well to it, obviously. And uh, there was a lot that happened in terms of trying to convince the Redis community not to go that way. Um, Redis' strike two came with um, them deciding, so Redis was an open source community project, and then there was a company called Redis that was formed that basically hosted this project somewhere. And so somehow this company started to exert, wanted to exert ownership over this, and so that, you know, what required the that was what the motivation for the license change that happened right before. And so forming Redis, the company, as a commercial entity with the same name as the open source project and you know, benefiting from all of the developer goodwill of over 10 years was strike two. Um, and you know, then we come to strike three, where um, Redis essentially performed like a massive licensing change once again. And that led a lot of companies to now coalesce around what is known as the Val Key project. Um, the notion for the naming comes from being a key value store, basically. And so um, Val Key is now a part of the Linux Foundation, uh, and um, it continues to thrive in the hands of a community that's um, you know, very diverse in terms of the different companies that are there. And a lot of the original contributors to Redis um, are now shifting focus and continuing and you know, are looking to contribute to Valky and grow the project and things like that. And these stories, you know, really um, make me very, I think, very existentially at times. I mean, I love open source. Um, open source is what puts bread and butter on the table at home. Open source has paid for my ticket here. Uh, and so I really care about open source software, um, you know, being well preserved. Uh, passed along to the next generation as it is supposed to be. And the intent for open source software was about creating a group of individuals who really loved uh, doing what they do and caring about software. And time and again, when I see all of these issues, it's about, um, that are about, you know, very fine print legalese that nobody reads. Uh, it pains me uh, to see where the community is heading. And uh, you know, this is really an appeal to those who are watching. If you're a programmer, if you're on the fringes of you know, working with software, please take some time to understand what licenses are. Um, please take some time to understand what it is that you're actually putting inside the software that you write. And you know, please don't issue cease and desist. <laughs> letters to other contributors in future. 
I'm Ram Iyengar once again. Uh, that's me on most social media. Thank you so much for coming to my talk. Thank you, Open Source Summit, for having me. And you know, um, there's I'm sure there's a lot I can learn from you, in addition to you know what you can uh, learn from here. So that's my talk. Happy to take any questions, comments, feedbacks, whatever you might have. Thanks. Yes. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the role of the contributor license agreement in the ability to relicense projects in this way. Yeah, so I think the what I've left out in, in all of this and what somebody was uh, asking me was the DOCs and the CLAs. So um, the question is, what is the role that um, contributor agreements and um, other things play? I think it's uh, you know very important that there are uh, these entities that um, you know sort of serve as a as a framework for you know showcasing some kind of commitment that somebody has for a project. Um, because of the nature of open source, we obviously can't hold people to certain commitments. Uh, but I think they serve a good purpose in terms of being able to attest who the contributors are, where they come from, what their motivations are, and things like that. Um, so for those who are not aware of what these do, they're basically documents that you exchange with uh, the, the governing bodies around open source projects to specify that you're a contributor and um, you, you really, um, you know, you, you agree by certain terms that are laid out through the license as an individual who's participating in the in the project. Uh, and so by agreeing to the terms in there, you're obviously um, you know buying into the larger premise of what the project represents. Uh, but also you're not immune to changes. So um, it really affects a lot of people who've signed these and exchanged these documents and have agreed to become contributors and committers and maintainers and all of these things. And so I think in a, in a more philosophical way, it does break trust when you switch licenses and things like that for the people who've signed these agreements. Uh, but in just open source as a business kind of way, it's not the way to do things. So uh, that would be my two cents. Thanks for explaining the, uh, the couple of recent sure. uh, stories that happened. Um, one of the commonalities that I see in all these incidents is uh, those who are early proponents of open source at some point, mm -hmm. obviously at some point, you know, once they you know, attain a certain level of adoption, they tend to make more short-sighted short decisions. Sure. So I'm kind of curious, um, like for some of these forked projects like Valky and, you know, uh, the ES and Kibana, I think that got yep. into open yep. search. Yep. What what are the recommendations, or you know, what are your thoughts on what we can do as an open source community to ensure that such a thing doesn't happen down the line? <laughs> um, you know, folks, uh, let's say once they attain a certain level of adoption, what what's the guarantee they won't change it further? So, is there anything that we can do to uh, prevent such incidents happening? I think it's a very uphill battle we're fighting against free market forces and capitalism in general. But I don't want to uh, make this like a political science discussion. Uh, I think there's, there's some merits to doing a lot of education around, you know, here's what it takes to be an open source project, and here's the intent of it being open source and things like that. And, get people sensitive about, you know, you don't switch licenses willy-nilly to suit commercial needs. But I also think that there's like a huge human factors in play here that are really outside the control of any individual or any community for that matter that doesn't exert a certain amount of control. Um, I think the newer projects um, and the newer sort of governance structures that are in place, um, you know, really help. So like if you see the way working groups are organized now and um, 
the way technical advisory committees and uh, technical oversight committees are all organized now i think they are sort of very important in insulating all of the things uh, that we've identified but i think it is human nature to you know find a way around all these and circumvent any sort of controls that we might exert and so i think the answer is to have better governance in place more transparent governance in place and continue to you know support projects let's say like the lf who really go out there and educate people about you know here's what open source is and here's how you should be while contributing and um, really there's there's so much that is happening in terms of um, you know where the industry intersects with open source communities and how better governance has happened and so as we start to evolve these governance models maybe you know we we become more insular to these changes yeah, I mean, again, when I look at some of the also aspects of these proponents shifting licenses, one uh, potential reason that I could think of is at some point these open sources are getting used as like, you know, packaged as managed services and someone who is running those managed services monetizing them. Correct. Perhaps they are not essentially sharing that with or supporting the, the community behind. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. probably why we... Mm -hmm the original proponents kind of see mm -hmm. that and they say, hey, well, they are making millions out of sure. this and, sure. you know. Uh, yeah, like I said, capitalism and free market forces and I think uh, values that we hold as a community is a very small force against those. It's tough, Thanks. but we'll keep, you know, chipping away at it yeah. as much as we can. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thanks for the presentation. So um, I had a question about some of the stuff you said about um, HashiCorp, OpenTofu. Um, just, I guess I have two parts. Um, so the first part is, have you had a chance, I'm curious from um, your perspective from a technical um, standpoint, have you had a chance to look at all at, at the code that was attached in, in any of the cease and desist? Do you have any thoughts yes. of it? And then the second question is, um, you know, being a member, of the, a very strong member of the open source community, being a developer and watching this sort of unfold in real time, um, is there anything from the outside that you think um, can be learned from kind of what's what's happened um, as, as um, there's been an attempt to fork it, things that have gone well and things that, that could have been done maybe differently to improve I don't know if there's anything that could have been done to, to, to prevent the system <laughs> desist letter, but, but um, I'm just curious what your perspectives are on those two sides. Sure, so uh, the answer to your first question is yes, there's been very specific, um, there's very specific information about the exact pieces of code that they claimed were stolen. Um, so, and then I think the Open Tofu community has immediately issued clarification and um, things like that. To answer your second question, I think you know it extends from like the previous answer in terms of uh, what is it that we've learned. Um, we've learned that humans can be evil, <laughs> and uh, I, I think you know we're going to continue to see that um, people are going to find ways in which to try and prevent um, ways, uh, try and protect their investments and organizations and commercial entities and put their commercial interests over any other interests that they might, they might have. Like, for example, HashiCorp built its business on the shoulders of an open community. And to turn your back around to, again, that's why I put the word fair use in there. Is it, is it legal for them to do what they did? Absolutely, yes. But was it moral for them to do what they did? Probably not. So it goes against the notion of fair use, but it's not entirely an illegal thing to want to switch your open source licenses of your project into some other open source licenses that are more beneficial to you as a business. So we've left these loopholes open. Um, I don't know. I think you know uh, the community at large must learn to you know try and work on projects that are diverse in terms of their initial ownership. So 
not buy into like single vendor open source projects and try to push them in the direction of a broader more diverse more open governance model i think you know if there's enough developers i think by now we should learn to you know push in that direction that that's one trend that does worry me there are so many single vendor backed open source projects out there that are really good um, you know and and i for all my talks and other things i continue to be proponents of some of those projects because they genuinely bring value to developers um in addition to you know trying and finding more developers and evangelizing these projects i think i must also do a job of hey as a contributor and maintainer maybe this community needs to be more diverse and you know get a more open governance model as opposed to depending on the budgets of the single company that do things and that's where foundations help a lot so if you can find a nice home for open source projects in neutral uh you know vendor neutral open governance foundations i think it it really helps and we've been making very small strides in terms of getting there and um i don't think as a community we have the maturity we're very good at looking at a new project applying it to our um, you know tool chain and deriving value out of it we're also somewhat good at looking at these open source projects building business models around it and monetizing it but i don't think the maturity is there yet for looking at an open source project and saying hey this does not have a diverse open governance model yet let's change that so i think that would be a step in the right direction there's no more questions well thank you enjoy the rest of your evening and see you around <laughs>